Thank you, Daniel. So we were just talking behind the scenes, um, Ellen Letter and John Newby and myself uh, with Daniel and Wickham uh, about this panel. And one of the things I wanted to highlight, I didn't really write an intro. I want this to be a very casual conversation. Um, when Daniel approached me to do this uh, panel, uh, it was a little scary because uh, we're talking about crew members who work very behind the scenes. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things about lighting and costume that I personally don't know about myself. But we also start talking about the idea of regionalism and regional filmmaking, what it means to be working outside of the studio and and, um, and with these people who don't normally have a voice to talk about the work that they do. So the framework that I'm setting here is very, very A, casual, but B, also, uh, we're gonna go way back to the beginning um, in terms of like, there are things like terms best boy and grip and that I don't necessarily understand the ins and outs of. And so we're gonna try to kind of approach this very 101. Um, I will tell you that they are incredibly charming people. Um, and I'm super excited because I found out that they both have ties to The Mutilator, which is like one of my favorite films. And so I'm really excited to talk to them about everything in their horror movie careers and a little beyond, hopefully. And I just want to give you some idea of their credits post um, the films that they worked on in the 80s. So Ellen Lutter, um, you know, is a costume designer uh, and a very prominent one. She's worked on a lot of amazing projects, but um, some of her stuff includes uh, Shades of Blue, The Ridiculous Six, um, Max, Sex and the City, uh, you Don't Mess With the Zohan, 50 First Dates, The Longest Yard, Little Nicky, 54, Flirting with Disaster, it's fantastic, Living in Oblivion, and Fresh. Um, you might notice that uh, there's a lot of Adam Sandler movies in there. She's worked with Adam Sandler quite a bit, I think, for the like last, I don't know, dozen or so projects. Um, and they collaborate on a lot of different things, and that's fantastic. Um, and John Newby, of course, is now a cinematographer, and he's worked on the Flash TV series, the one that was in the 90s. Um, He's photographed such projects as Dead Sun Rising, Desert Saints, the TV series Heroes, Ringer, CSI New York, um, Masters of Sex. Uh, also here in his biography was really interesting. He wrote, he, uh, he has also had the rare opportunity of serving as director of photography on a show scan large format film in Hong Kong titled Hong Kong Havoc that was shot on 65 millimeter and projected at 60 frames per second. Um, and a lot of that is French to me. So we're hope I'm hoping to learn a lot in this conversation as, as well. So if we could bring in Ellen and John and we can kind of get started. Um, thank you both so much for coming to talk to me about these movies that I um, I write about and historicize, but also that I totally go goofy over. Um, I'm a huge fan of horror, especially this era. And um, as I said at the beginning of this conversation and to you before we started, um, you know, we as academics, we talk a lot about subtext and about all these things. And we, we don't always put a face to the people making these films, especially outside of the above the line crew, like the director, you know, and the screenwriter and all that stuff. And here's a really good chance to hear about the work that you did and, and what you do now and what you learned and what it was like to be in this golden era of horror that's so amazing and that so many people, uh, like in my paper that I presented, 40 years have passed and these movies are still getting new releases uh, on home video. And people are buying them up and we love them and we're writing about them and um, we're just watching them all the time. And so I wanna go back to the beginning and just learn about you guys before we get started into this kind of work you did in the 80s. So my first question goes to both of you. I'll start with Ellen. How did you become interested in your chosen career and uh, what kind of education did you pursue to get uh, started? Uh, I became interested I became interested in my career, I guess, as a tiny kid, watching television and going to the movies with my dad. And um, I felt like uh, I recognized something in medium. I felt like I understood something in it. I always, you know, just kind of felt an affinity for it. Uh, and then I didn't do anything with that. <laughs> it's like I didn't go to school for it. Uh, I went to school. Um, I wound up studying Spanish. And when I got out of school, uh, I took a few film courses in school, but I guess it was more like film appreciation. And um, I uh, wound up being in, you know, coming back to New York and um, working in a frozen food company 
that um, that made meal plan that that sold meal plans and pinball machines to contractors, American contractors in Saudi Arabia. And the company, the headquarters was moving to um, Perth Amboy, New Jersey. And at that time I was um, hanging around with other little film freak kids. And one of them was um, Chris Avelson, who was the nephew of John Avelson from Rocky and Joe and, you know, a bunch of stuff. And um, I could get unemployment if I didn't go to Perth Amboy and work on a trauma film. So I did. So it was like my first experience was the romantic comedy squeeze play directed by Lloyd mm. Hoffman. And I worked for free. I had an <laughs> Yay. Yay. What a way to get started, right? Yeah. And, and John, then, oh, and sorry. And I kind of decided, you know, I, I would um, pursue yeah. costumes. It was difficult. It, for me, it was, it was kind of um, a more, an easier road as a woman. Mm. Um, and, you know, I felt like I could get, you know, I felt like it would be easier and I could get more work um, pursuing that. Um, and I always had an interest in character and also fashion, which fashion doesn't always have anything to do with cost. I mean, it's not like it has nothing to do with costumes, you know. Um, and I uh, took some classes and then just uh, kept getting hired. That's fabulous. Um, that's interesting. You talk about um, kind of falling into costume design and wardrobe at the beginning. Uh, when you envisioned yourself as a little girl working in film, like having it as a dream, did, was there a particular position that you actually wanted or did you just know you wanted to work in film? Uh, I think I might have wanted to be an actress somewhere in there. And I did that and I did that stuff in high school, but I knew in high school I was it was going to not gonna happen. I mean, I was, <laughs> no, that I was wasn't walking different. around with my face. Well, you know, yeah. I was walking around with my face it wasn't gonna happen. Um, oh. But I think probably a director. Probably. Oh, fantastic! And uh, John, how did you get interested in working in film? Well, um, you know, as a kid in those days, in the fifties, um, cinemas were you know, tell it wasn't much on television that was that interesting. There was old movies maybe late at night, but um, um, so it was a family thing of being taken to to largely uh, big big event films especially. So we're talking like uh, Lawrence of Arabia, Ben-Hur, um, mm -hmm. you know, things like this and um, West Side Story, you know, and and so that was the start of it and I, and I loved all those films. And then my brother took me to see uh, The Trial um, by Orson Welles directed by Orson Welles, mm -hmm. um, which was done in the uh, early 60s, I believe, in Eastern Europe. And it just, you know, it was black and white and, you know, odd ang Dutch angles and, and daring lens choices and, and, you know, a fascinating European cast and so forth. And, and it, um, it just opened my, I think I was 12 when I saw that, it just opened my, my mind up to what else there could be in, in cinema. Um, and so that, that, that really made things click. And then I, um, I went to, um, you know, and I did, I did photography, but not that, not that much, you know, really in high school, but I, I always had played with cameras and stuff. But, and then I, I went to uh, Boston University and um, studied political science history. And then I was in the School of Communications. So it was 50-50 with the political side of things and then, and then cinema. And it was, um, you know, journalism, television production, film production. And, um, and they, they didn't want people to spend too much time in film production. Like it was really, an emphasis on the liberal arts things, which I'm glad because, you know, I had Chinese history and uh, Russian history. And, you know, we were going to have a revolution, we thought at that time. And, <laughs> you know, it was, you know, Martin Luther King was being assassinated and Robert Kennedy and, and we were student strikes and it was crazy time. And, uh, and so, and there was a, lot, a number of um, foreign language cinemas in, in, in Boston at the time, you know, art, art house cinemas. And, um, and I just became captivated by um, works like, say, John Luc Godard, Alphaville, you know, and um, Weekend by him, and um, The Conformist, Bertolucci, uh, Satyricon, Fellini, you know, which is a film that I think, I think it's the first film I ever projected in a cinema because I got a job my second year in college working as a projectionist, which was just a blast to operate those giant, you know, 35 millimeter machines and, uh, 
and with the arc lights with the smokestack and then and then just you know and then eventually working in bigger cinemas like 3000 seat cinemas and this and you got this this beam of light in, in my mind you're just riding that down to the screen and it was just so exciting and um and i was you know making some money to help buy you know film stock and buy my bolex and all this kind of stuff um and then um but then i there was no real connection there was no the, the university offered nothing there was no mentorship in the industry it was just like oh good luck you know and and um and that's why so anyhow, i was saying i continuous a projectionist I, I worked in news and news film labs i operated the, the, the you know the processing machines i was a news film editor a stagehand and eventually i got a, a link to go to new york and um and work in, in the um as an electrician in New York, because I knew direct current, I knew arc lights, I knew cable, I knew, you know, the, especially the electricity part, because we were working with a lot of hot live electricity. In those days. And um, so that was that was the start. It was a little bumpy because there's a lot of um, political and gang conflicts between New York and Boston at that time with the unions. Mm -hmm. And we had two unions in New York and one in Boston. And it's a long, it's a, it's a whole other story, but it was messy, you know. And I've always said I got my start you know really it's white it's white privilege right because a friend of my brother's was already in the business mm. and it was a very white world and um so it was it was a nod through him that got me in the, the, the sort of like the hippie progressive union that was much more open to um to people whose parents weren't already in the industry uncles and whatever and um so i worked my way up as an electrician uh in New York. and then Fred the 13th was probably my first um I think it was my first job as as a best boy on on a on a feature film front you know front to back because I've been doing mostly the work was commercials in New York and then when a film came along no matter what it was it was like oh wow movie this is what I really wanted to do and so um, so that's where Friday the Thirteenth came it was uh, very exciting at the time. Um so I'm glad that you guys kind of both mentioned watching these movies like you threw out names like Adard and Fellini and and I think sometimes we forget that people who work in these movies have seen some of the great films, you know what I mean, and appreciate them. And like, for instance, Wes Craven was inspired by Mark Bergman when he made Last House on the Left. And so when you are getting started and you're either going to school and or you're going to these movies and having these kind of dreams of what you'd like to do, um, and then you start in these kind of modest productions like Mother's Day or like The Mutilator or Friday the 13th Part Two. Um, can you just talk a little bit both i'll start with ellen again just give me kind of a brief like memory you have about going on one of your first film sets and what it was like and um was it different than how you had originally envisioned what it would be well i don't think i really I don't think I really had an image of it other than like, you know, pop the guard in the, in, 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 at the big giant studio at the gates, like waving you through, you know what I mean? I mean, it wasn't, it, it, I, I don't think I really had a, a specific image of it um, in my head. It was uh, fun for sure. Because, you know, you, I mean, the first set that I went on was Squeeze Play. And um, I was, although I was mostly assisting the producer. And so I was in the office a lot, but I did go out to set and I did, you know, I did have some set responsibilities. And um, it was kind of fun. It was very attractive because, um, you know, it was sort of like a little family more so than you know it just it just it's funny it's it looks like all these people running around that you know if you see a film set and there are people there it's all this quit equipment and they're all running around and it's all this big stuff and it looks confusing and there's cable everywhere and all this kind and, and, and everything but actually it's strange it's almost like it's more about the people a film set in a weird way um it's more about negotiating the people than, you know, not, not tripping over cable. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering this. No, I think so. I'm just curious if like uh, the differences in like uh, how you got started and from where you kind of were envisioning yourself to start maybe is the question. Um, I don't know if John has a different answer for that maybe. 
I thought I was lucky I got on Squeeze Play. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm sure it was really I, it was, fun. I mean, yeah. we were going to the movies and seeing Eraserhead. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the Rocky Horror Show. It yeah, wasn't, yeah. you know, and and frankly, this the the studio, I mean, the the golden the golden era, uh, it was a plantation. You know, there was, and we were revol we were a revolutionary generation. We we didn't expect to, to do the, the, you didn't expect to do the same thing that your parents did. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you didn't respect or love the movies. It's just that you weren't going to do that. It wasn't like you were going to, you know what I mean? It was, you know, there was a, there was a more raw thing going on. Um, and, uh, I didn't feel, I mean, when I, when I got on squeeze play, I hoped it was the biggest hit in the world. I mean, I didn't feel like um, it was a job and it was sure. my entree and I got my foot in the door. And so I don't, I didn't really have, ex I didn't really have expectations. Like, cause the only thing I knew, like I said, was, you know, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers having an argument, you know, off to the side of the camera on the set. I mean, you didn't really, you know, what other sets had you seen really at that time? Not that much, not really. John, was the experience different for you when you first got started than how you thought it well, was I, going to be? I think it's I think it's very similar, you know, coming from different places, but yeah, very similar. I mean, I mean, when I was in in college, it was you know your head's just getting filled, at least in the programs I was in, filled with all this, you know, the the art of cinema and screening every you know all sorts of films as we know, you know, you do in film school, and um, and also because they were available. In cinemas at the time as well, crazy things were happening, and um, and so you're in that university setting, setting, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you get out there in the in the in the real world. And I continued to be a projectionist, but I was, you know, I was looking around for work, and I, I wasn't finding it. And and so just to do anything on a set about anything, it could be an industrial about medical equipment, it could be anything, and and it's like, okay. Now I'm doing something with, you know, with image and light and sound and, and a crew, and it might be three people, it might be 10, whatever, but it's, you know, that was exciting to start out with. But yeah, when I came out of film school, I was going to be in my head, I wanted to be the next Jean-Luc Godard. You know, we were going to have a, you know, a communist revolution in the United States and here we go and I'll be making <laughs> movies and, you know, and it was, you know, it was, those were like, yeah, it was, was spinning around at the time. And then, and then you go out and then you work, you know, you know, on, on films and this and that, you're working at a TV station. And I realized like, oh, because I was political, I said, I can't work at TV. These people are, this isn't what's going on in Boston, you know? And so I, it was good. I learned that because I thought news was kind of cool and it is, mm -hmm. but that time it was, it was not. So, um, and, uh, you know, the first big film I worked on as a day player, we say it, you know, day by day was a uh, big stick up at Brinks by William Friedkin huge movie in Boston in 1975 or so. And uh, because I was a projectionist, I knew how to run the, the arc lights, the fruit arcs at the time. And uh, we had 20 arcs a night. And the stagehands, which I was not a member of, didn't, didn't, they didn't know arcs anymore. They, they sort of disappeared from theater. And they hated to have a projectionist on their set, but you know, but they, I was, like, they needed me. So I got to do that. And I remember seeing the camera about a hundred yards away, I was on a rooftop in the north end of Boston, and night after night, and and I would, you know, and, and, and it was because we were just lighting. It was slow, it was slow film stock, so you had to just light everything with a lot of power. And I'd see the camera crew and little red and green lights on the, on the Panavision camera and the dolly track, and I, and I'd never even seen a, a a full camera crew work before in my life, and it was just it was kind of a lot of it was a misty, you know, five in the morning, misty near the near the harbor of Boston. It was like shit that's you know i want to get there you know i want to get closer to that that looks really great you know and it took me you know some more years to do that but but it, that was the and i think so it being in any project was great but i think that then the, the further that you're in the business then you get attitude about like <clears throat> well i want that project you know i want to be with when that those guys that team that producer that director of photography whatever you know and then you know and then but the business is so tough. It's so clicky. It's so just by mm -hmm. chance. 
you know, you can go to Sundance all you want, or you can go to this bar in New York all you want, you know, but maybe you'll meet that person and that'll connect, you know, and, um, or not. And then, so you, you develop a passion. I think Ellen touched on that. It's, it's about the team, the crew, there's something about making a, a film that's, um, you know, it's not sports, but it's, it's a team thing. It's a collaboration. And so often I'll be on set um, through this year and I'll just, and I'll watch it, a shot being executed because I'm not on the camera anymore operating. And, and I'll watch it, I'll see the boom operator and then the dolly grip watching the actor and the actor, and the assistant director cueing an actor, right? And, 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 and you know, and, and, the, and somebody putting a, a net to darken the light just for a moment when an actor gets too close, to walk away. And it's like, you know, 12, 14 people all doing very specific, minute craft moments, you know, at that point. And of course, before that we got to that point, back in, in Ellen's world, you know, there's all sorts of shit going on back in, in the trailers and, you know, weeks ahead of time or the day of or whatever and disasters and it doesn't fit or whatever, and, you know, and it's, 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 it's so exciting that you, I think a lot of us, if we don't find ourselves working in exactly the projects we want to work on, we find such joy in, 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 in the craft and the art of what we do. And, and it's a wonderful thing. And one thing I, I don't want to forget to say is, you mentioned like you're going to film school and a lot of us, you know, we learn about the history of cinema and so forth. The other interesting thing is, is there's another huge part of the industry, which is, is um, especially in, in my team, Script Electric Camera, is there are people who are basically like skilled construction workers, right? In fact, they work construction, but they're not doing film sometimes. And, as, and I'm speaking mostly about the, elect the, uh, the grip department, which are the riggers. And these are, these are, these are, gals and guys that can build houses and put a new roof on all this kind of stuff. But also they'll know like that net, they'll know like, if I say, hey, give me a double net uh, uh, when, they, when she walks by that mark, you know, fade, you know, fade it in, fade it out. You know. Wink, got it, sure. And they bring that in. And, and so they're, they're, they're artisans and artists of light. Mm -hmm. And then 10 minutes later, they're like hoisting a, you know, a, you know or carrying a dolly, you know, upstairs or they're, you know, hammering something into safety, something and rigging and so forth. And it's like, and it's just, it's just such wonderful work that so many people get to do. It's just so great. Yeah. I think that that's I one of the, the greatest things about having you guys here is because it's not often we get to talk to people who worked in the wardrobe department or who were the grip or best boy. These aren't the voices that we go to, but the things that you're talking about when these, uh, and having so much fun on a set and it being about the people you guys are these little families coming in for like uh, 15, 20 days, right? And kind of trying to create something, you know, um, and just having the joy of being able to be creative with it. And so I think uh, I want to ask John exactly if you could just briefly tell me what a grip and best boy does, because those were, or gaffer, I think was your credits and then, and um, yeah. best boy. And if you could just briefly yeah. kind of tell us what those are, because I have okay. like a vague yeah. idea. Sure. Yeah. And, and, um, in the, in the UK, I think it's it's similar, although they, they, they change a little bit country to country, you know, Italy, especially Italy, Italy, France, UK, and the United States. But anyhow, so the gaffer is, is the uh, the head, quote, the head electrician. Uh, current credit also is sometimes chief uh, lighting technician. So the gaffer is is, uh, is the creative collaborator with the director of photography. And so um, and some directors of photography, they know exactly what they want, others don't especially if they don't have a background in lighting. So, so they have a huge input in terms of like, oh, you want this kind of a feel? Okay, how about this light? How if I redo this, we do that and so forth, right? And the gaffer stays really by the, the director of photography and you know, near the director and right, right on set all the time, um, virtually all the time. And then um, the best boy back in the 70s, 80s in New York and the East Coast, the best boy was, um, would, would run the crew um, um, and, and sort of manage equipment on a day-to-day -day basis, basis. And, um, but also they were responsible for like hot, we were hot patch ins to power. That was a crazy thing in New York at, at that time. And, and it was a lot of fun, um, if you like doing it. And, and so you go up on, on power, you know, uh, power poles, you know, and, or top of a roof and you'd skin off the wire till you get to the copper and you clamp on and safely. And then, and there's your, you know, there's your power for your, your show, you know, for, for your scene. You, we do this in commercials and features and, and you do it in crazy places like wet basements, you know, and crumbling buildings, mm -hmm. you know, 
and so forth. And, and anyhow, it, it's something it's not done anymore, but that was your job. You do that. And then you, and then best boy would also manage the distribution, the power distribution, the, the cabling and all that, which is now done by pre-rig teams. It's unheard of to have that be done the same day by the, the shooting crew, but we had smaller crews in those days and, and that's just what it was. And, um, but best boys is, is a really is, is a, can be a career choice. And, and some people that's, that's, they, they shine in that and they, you know, and that's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's a good job. Um, okay. So then, then you have, um, and you have a best boy grip as well, um, which does the same kind of functions and, and the grip department, um, key grip is the head, the head grip. And that's, uh, any kind of rigging of cameras. So that could be whether it's on a, going on a dolly and then, you know, you have a dolly, uh, a dolly, uh, grip operator, you know, operates the dolly, which is an art in its own place. There's only, there's never enough good dolly grips in the world in any given moment, never. And because um, they have to move, you know, hundreds of pounds um, of gear and people as an actor makes a different choice on a, on a, on a nuance. Um, and uh, I worked at Ellen, I know uh, Don Cerrone, um, who's a key grip. And then he was, uh, he was, we're doing a, Film with Lindsay Anderson called "The Whales of August," mm-hmm. and Alan uh, was on that with me. And um, anyhow, uh, Betty Davis was in it. Mm-hmm. Marvel. Oh, I know the film. Her. Yeah, yeah. And 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 he um, had this. He would make pies for her on weekends. He loved to cook. He cooked meals for her and stuff. But anyhow, he would he would have this relationship with her in terms of her movement. And she and she mentioned to him once. She says, "You know, my closest relationship on set as an actress while performing." very often is the dolly grip because I know they're watching every twitch of a muscle in my body as to what I'm going to do. If it's, am I going to stand up now or later and so forth. Anyhow, that's, that's uh, all part of the, the grip department. And, it, and also the grip department does everything to do with um, uh, rigging of lights um, and rigging of, of uh, sun control or shaping, shaping lights on interior sets. So the nets, scrims, um, flags, cutting a light, making a shadow things like that. Um, that's all in their world. And then operating cranes. Yeah, it's such an important component to horror movies, which are all about mood lighting. And exactly. like that. And I want to, yeah. I kind of want to get into the work that you guys have done. So I think the film that you worked on together was uh, Friday the 13th part two, but just to briefly let everybody know, Ellen also worked on He Knows You're Alone, which is the movie. Um, oh, you also worked on The Clairvoyant, also directed by our mom, Mastriani, who did He Knows You're Alone. Um, I think they also, they also both starred, and now I'm drawing a blank on the actress's name, Elizabeth. Oh, Kemp. I can't remember her name. Elizabeth Kemp. Yes, who's wonderful in both of those films. Um, and Mother's Day, of course, oh. uh, which is a wonderful film, which Willie Kaufman talked about. He said it was one of his favorite projects, like his masterpiece, and that it's a satire, not a horror film. And again, Friday 13th, part two. And John, you had worked on a movie called Death Mask from 1984 with Farley Granger, directed by Richard Friedman, who was only 21 right. when he made it. And it's a fascinating right. movie. I, I love it. Yeah. And of course, The Mutilator from around 85 with Buddy Cooper, which was shot in North Carolina and is really regional filmmaking. Um, and again, Friday 13th, part two and The Exterminator 2. Um, Ellen, uh, you've done a lot of amazing things in your life, but I think one of the most amazing things for people watching this would be that you were Jason, right? Briefly yeah. in Friday the 13th part two. So I have, I have a, distinction. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple of questions about that. First of all, how did that happen? And also let's talk about what you did with helping define Jason's look in that film. Well, I wound up being Jason, I think, you know, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not really sure, but what I think is um, we didn't have, they wanted someone smaller for, you know, uh, as though Jace, this whole, you know, scene with Alice in the house and, and the walk to the house was as if Jason was younger than mm-hmm. um, uh, when we finally made him killing people in the movie. So this was sort of a little bit of a flashback um, and I think they forgot to get anyone really. And I fit <laughs> the stuff that we had, cause we had stuff, you know, you know, you have a bunch of stuff and you're also, you know, like, and, and especially any wardrobe person, any costume designer knows that sometimes you don't wait till you have casting to get stuff because you can wind up screwed and, you know, you're better off having things and, you know, you also have fallout. 
And um, so I uh, fit in the, you know, I fit in the thing. I was there, which is also, you know, like pretty much um, how you get into movies. <laughs> Or not, I was just like, yeah, all right, I'll do it. And so I um, have that distinction. I get a lot of fan mail. <laughs> do you? Yeah, and I get requests for autographs. And um, and the last time, as a matter of fact, we were visiting John in Montreal, me and my husband, and we were running around. You know, he was working, and we were running around in. Um, uh, these shops in this area by McGill University. And there was some cute little shop we went into with a bunch of stuff in it. And uh, they had a Jason doll in there. That was the Jason doll from Friday the 13th part two. And Tom is like, look, <laughs> it's Jason. And so we were both like laughing about it. And, you know, Tom said to the guy, Ellen was the costume designer on this job. So I signed it. I signed his Jason no. and then the price went up. <laughs> <laughs> You're valuable. That's amazing. I know it's so, weird. It's really weird. <laughs> I got, you know, and for I've been asked to do interviews. This is the first interview I've ever done talking oh. about it. Because I didn't want to break the mystique. <laughs> well, I'm curious about like, does did you uh play a part in designing his costume or was that already in the script? No, it wasn't in the script. It was only it was only boots. And um, a hood, hood, hooded. He was a hooded figure. You saw his boots. It said, "Oh, boots come into frame," or a hooded figure there. And it's funny. I just reread the script because I found it in um, the special collections at the um, Lincoln Center Library for the Performing Arts. And they have in a special room. It's like a vaulty thing. So you have to go in and leave all your stuff outside. But anyway, so I thought, well, what the hell? I'll, I'll, I'll read it. I'll, it'll freshen my memory. And there was nothing in it. And I remember hmm. also that we thought about some, you know, we thought about doing something slimy and, you know, weird and maybe it's rubbery a little bit. But um, Jason's not uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon. It's a, it's a much simpler thing. It's a much, I don't want to say nondescript. It was just, it was the idea that this is some guy that lives in the woods, steals stuff off clothing lines and like runs in and out of the woods and is, is kind of magically here, there and everywhere, you know, that kind of thing. So it didn't really need something spectacular it needed something really simple and sometimes mm -hmm. simple is scarier anyway mm -hmm. you know and also cheaper yeah right? <laughs> that's true yeah well it's his most iconic look for me i mean part two is my favorite film and so i wanted to ask john you know working on that mm -hmm. um what did you learn about the art of lighting like genre movies um because that movie is really moody and very well done um and uh, could you just talk a little bit about working on it and um, what you did and, and it, if you learned anything from that experience? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I learned, you know, a couple of months ago, I was still learning on set. So it's, it's every day, which is yeah, yeah. Part of the, a lot of the fun of it. But um, that, yeah, I was I was fairly new. And well, like I said, I, I'd done primarily commercials at that time. And um, and they weren't uh, they weren't that moody or scarier, you know. That wasn't the vibe of most commercials at that moment. Um, so I learned, I learned a lot. I learned it. And, um, you know, it was, uh, and Ellen and I were talking the other day that it looked that we even remembered, you know, it does, does hold up, you know, um, mm -hmm. photographically. And, and it's, um, yeah, the, the interesting thing is, is that you, when you work on, on horror genre, anything in that direction, but especially horror, you know, it's, it is mood. That's the whole point of it is mood. And there may be, you know, like in Friday the 13th, you know, bucolic, you know, summer camp going to town, sunlight, the lake, you know, and that's that's sort of a counterpoint to to the, the darkness that comes at night and so forth. But but really the whole point of the project is that 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 move, the, the fright, you know, the frightening mood and all that sort of thing. So so it's it's a wonderful place to be to be working, to be learning lighting. And then, and I, um, the reason I went to lighting wasn't just because I knew electricity as a projection, it's also my friend in New York, 
was assistant cameraman. He said, John, he said, this town is full of assistant camera people. He said, and, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a trajectory that's, that's slow. He says, but it's, there's way too many assistant camera people. He says, but, but this, but we need more. It seems like he thought we need more electricians and no more people in the lighting department. He says, and you'll get to learn lighting from all sorts of directors of photography, which is, he was totally right. And, uh, and cause we were working with a lot of, um, of out of the country, a lot of, um, European directors of photography at the time. And, um, so, um, yeah, Friday and, and, and then Mutilator for me as in, I wasn't the best boy and that was on Mutilator, I was a gaffer. So, um, and, um, so working with a DP on that, who was very young as well, you know, had a, had a lot of input that I was able to contribute to that with, with uh, Peter Shaw on that film. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, and I think that even, you know, if you look at my reel today, it's, it's, you know, what I really want to show off is always the mood, the darkness, the yeah. shadow, you know, it's just kind of what I, and I, and I hate to get into it. It's because it is script by script. Some shows do not want to be like that. Some shows want, you know, open shout, you know, open fill light and softness. And they, they want to be even, even some films that are very frightening nowadays are, are they yeah. go against the, you know, the, the conceit of, of, of a, of a so-called noir feel and all that sort of thing. And uh, which I think is interesting too. They, they go for the, the banal, the average, and then there is this, this horrible thing that's happening. But, um, but it was a great training ground. And um, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's fantastic. And went in a lot of night work, you know, a lot of exterior mm -hmm. nights. And in those days it was slow film stock. So instead of uh, using like nowadays, no lights or a 300 watt light, we're using at least a 2000 watt light, you know, every, 12 feet in the woods you know? and you had to bring it and put it up and you know it was a lot of work and, and 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 you had to make it in the end not look like you got a bunch of huge lights up you know that was the hard part in those days so um yeah it was it was very it informed me you know to this day all that all that experience oh, that's great um and i wasn't sure if this was a good question or not when i put it down but ellen when you're designing costumes for a movie like friday the 13th part two does the idea that those costumes are going to get totally destroyed do you have to can uh, figure out outfits that work right for the kind of effects that they're using, or were you just able to design the costumes and they worked with that? No, never. You, you. It, it's almost never that you don't take the logistics into consideration. I mean, you, if you're working on a job with um, visual effects, you completely have to understand what's needed. I mean, it, it and it, you know, and it cha and it's changed drastically. And very recently, we used to have like green screen used to be the thing for special mm -hmm. effects. And now it's about motion capture, you know, and layering and stuff like that. It's not it's it's not so much a mechanical, physical thing anymore. And you have to be completely aware of what those you know, what exactly those effects are going to be. And if you were and if you have a lot of stunts, that's really huge. Mm -hmm. It's really huge because usually there's more than one person that's going to be wearing the costume um and then there's probably different stages of distress and we don't shoot in order we shoot um well we shoot by a shooting schedule uh, a one-liner that the ad's break down the script and then they're organized according usually to location or actor availability or something like that you, it's very rare you shoot sequences in um order Mm -hmm. And so you need a before and an after. You need a bunch of befores. You need a bunch of afters to go back and forth. And sometimes you need to pad actors. Um, you need to take into consideration, you know, like their safety and stuff like mm -hmm. that. They're running. They're this or that. They, you know, like what needs to be covered. What need, you know, like how do you need how how do you, you know, how do you make it magic? How do you make it so that you're not aware of the harnesses, the ratchets, the padding, the blood bags, the, <laughs> the squibs, you know, all that stuff. So that it's like, you're not thinking about it at all. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, the event happens. And um, it's kind of like, you know, it, that's one of the things that's really, really valuable about working on horror film is that you really do understand that you, you really have, you really grasp that because it's really mm -hmm. important. It's really, really important. You can't run out of, you you just can't run out of the clothing. You can't, you can't do that. So, um, 
you know, and, and, and so, uh, and also it teaches you a lot about distressing things, which is also a really important part of the, uh, of costume design, making things look old, uh, that are new, uh, and just maybe lightly worn in or very worn in, or it's been in the attic for a hundred years, or it was in a fire or it was on a corpse, you know, or whatever it is. So, uh, and, and that's one of, and it's interesting. That's one of the, um, more, it, it's actually a difficult aspect of doing costumes because a lot of times you don't have enough time. It takes time to do it properly. It takes talent. It takes money. And mm -hmm. sometimes you don't have all those things. Sometimes, you know, you get the, um, cast, you get the clothing and it's like, all you can do to wash it a few times. It's like, it's, it's really true. It's, um, it's a really interesting dilemma. If you ever watch a movie and you feel like the stuff looks too clean, I guarantee to you, <laughs> guarantee to you that it's like, it, it, other than that was a, 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 a decision. Um, uh, I guarantee to you that it, it was problematic for whatever reason. You know? <laughs> That'll be something to look out for. Um, yeah. So um, I also want to just talk about Mother's Day because uh, one of the things about Mother's Day that makes it so fantastic for me are the characters of Ike and Adley and their house and the way they're dressed. And um, and I'm just curious, did you work with the set designer on that? And how did you help build the character's wardrobe? Um, where did, was that, in, were those, again, were those things in the script or did you just sit down and kind of figure out what they needed to look like? Um, well, uh, it was scripted that Ike loved disco and Adley, oh no, Ike <laughs> loved punk and Adley loved disco, which was and still is an argument among baby boomers. Am I right? <laughs> yes. Still, still people would be like, I hate it, I hate it, you know, whatever. And um, so there was that. Um, thereby, there were punk elements. Um, Ike had orange hair and he had uh, like a studded bracelet. Um, it was scripted that, um, it was scripted that, that, um, they were in sweatpants and fatigues. Um, at the time, army Navy surplus, military surplus surplus was all over the place. And it was also p pretty popular. Um, young people were wearing, young people were wearing, you know, a lot of thrift, a lot of army Navy, you know, the whole thing. And um, it was interesting. It was, it was kind of interesting to get, to be able to get pieces like um, Adley's hood, you know, I don't even know what the hell that thing was other than maybe some kind of, some kind of, you know, swamp equipment, you know, uh, I really don't, it's not a beekeepers thing. It's, but Anyway, and um, the flight helmet for um, Ike, uh, all of it really felt kind of right because, first of all, it was scary and kind of creepy, and yet also, you know, appealing in a weird way. And then on and and recognizable in a strange way, it's kind of like a contemporary aesthetic, which is something you all, always have to take into consideration mm -hmm. when you're doing stuff, even if it's period or whatever. You kind of have to like what's what is pleasing to the audience, which recognizable, acceptable, you know, this kind of thing. And, um, and, uh, and wait a second. Oh yeah. And also that mother was kind of a drill sergeant. Mm -hmm. She was like, definitely like calling the shots and, you know, like putting them through their paces. So that sort of felt right. And, um, you know, it was, it, it just, it just was the right thing to do. I mean, Adley was in a distressed uh, pajama top with uh, um, sweatpants and Superman suspenders, which if you tried to put Superman suspenders on a rapist today, um, first, of yeah, all, that's right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> first of all, you need a contract from DC <laughs> yeah. comics, if they would even let you do it, if they would even let you do it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, and you need a legal department. Right. Because you do, because legal department is huge. That's the other thing that's huge. 
um, in film. It's it's like everything has to be cleared. It's incredible. It's it's another part of your job. You you um you, you we liaison uh, with the legal department constantly, and everything everything has to be cleared, and um, deals have to be made. It, it's it's really it's really amazing. I mean. You know, whether or not you would want your trademark on something that you weren't happy with, right. naturally, you know, it's your right. It's just incredible. It's gotten really, really nuts. <laughs> yeah, I actually had a job interview once where my job was to read scripts and see if they like if they have a Coke, then I have to contact Coca-Cola and make right. sure they can use it and stuff. And I thought that would have been a really interesting job, but for whatever reason, it didn't work out. <laughs> but before we get to uh, the kind of the tail end of the questions, I, I, I want to bring up The Mutilator because that's a very unique film. Um, because Buddy Cooper, I guess like Death Mask in a way, it's different and the same. Um, he was novice. He was a novice. And he wanted to just kind of make a movie. And uh, there's a whole story behind it that's huge. And if anybody has the Arrow Blu-ray release, it has a lot of information about how he came to be. But it was just a guy who had some money. And I think he said he could either like buy a winery or make a movie or something like that. And he's like, I'm going to make a movie. And he got some people from New York to come to North Carolina and work. And I'm just curious if you could just talk a little bit about your memories of working on that film, because it feels so much like, in some ways, the way Richard Freeman's Death Mask was sort of a college thesis, it felt like for Buddy Cooper it was also sort of like this, not a thesis, but this project thing, you know, that he was sort of diving into. And I'm just curious if you could just talk about uh, your memories of that film, John. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it was, it was, I don't know. I don't know the what led up to it. All of a sudden, it's like okay, I was going down there, you know. And um, it was um, and Buddy was. I think he was a lawyer in real estate and so forth. I think. And was it uh, Wrightsville? Wrightsville Beach. Wrightsville? Uh, it's know. Atlantic Beach. I think is where they shot it. Atlantic Beach. Okay, and and it has that classic East Coast pier, you know. And every yeah. every week or so, they somebody would bring a big, huge, you know, eight foot thresher shark out of there and so forth. And, and, um, and, and, and it was all, we were all based in this, um, very modest family motel resort. It was just very neat and clean. And there's all this, this playground, this outrageous sort of playground equipment, which we never filmed around. Um, you know, there was all kind of from the fifties and, um, and Buddy was, was someone who, you know, coming from New York city, you know, when you go South, you go South and it's like, it's another country for those of us from the North. And, and in some ways it's not, but, um, it, you know, we're in a whole new world and, and then, and there's buddy and, you know, heavy Southern accent, real friendly guy, real nice guy. And he really knew, he really figured this out. Very smart guy. He really figured out, he knew the genre and, you know, a lot of times people who just happen to have money to make a movie, they, they don't know. It, it's one thing to not know what you're doing, but they also don't know how to get help trying to achieve what they want. But he had it all down, you know, in terms of, okay, you're going to do that and you'll do a good job. That'll be great. And you're going to do that and so forth. You know? And and so very, very collaborative guy. And, uh, and he had, uh, I think Mark Showstrom down there, mm -hmm. uh, uh, special effects makeup, uh, who went on to Star Trek and all sorts of things. And, um, who was very young at the time, of course, but, but also already very skilled and, um, close to the level of a certain number of people that worked on Friday the 13th. And because um, there's a lot of, a lot of glue, a lot of chemicals, a lot of prosthetics that, that had to be worked on and so forth. And um, you know, it was, it was one of those. It was very pleasant. You know, the weather was great, and the locations were nice. And, and it was, it was a, a, a weird, unique group of, of people from, from New York. And uh, and then there was there was a college connection you may mm -hmm. know of, where a lot of the crew, they're sort of the, the production assistants came from. Yeah. And um, the production office. And so and there was a professor, an older professor, and then he prowled and got this group of young people to work on as well. And that, that was very cool as well. But it was a union film. I mean, there was actually a, a, a mm. Navy 15 contract on it, which is amazing. And because um, once I moved to the West Coast, it was unions were like almost destroyed by 1990. But um, and, and the thing with the film was that, that, that um, you know, personally, I've always had an issue with with graphic violence, and in films, and I like I like the intimation of it. You know, films like say Performance by Nick Nick Rogue, Donald Camel, mm -hmm. was extreme gang, British gang violence, gangster violence, 
and then there's Mick Jagger and there's drugs and there's Anita Palmberg and there's sex and you don't know whose who's nipple is male or female. I mean, it, one of my favorite films of all time. Um, and there's horrible violence in that film, but it, it, it's sort of so endemic to the script and it comes and it goes. Um, and in The Mutilator, there was a certain amount of violence and I, I don't remember how much, but there were some scenes that were just, one in particular that I don't even want to describe. I know what you're talking heart. about, yeah. Okay, and so, um, and this this is a testimony to Buddy also. I mean, so several of us met with him a few days. We said, so we knew they were working in the prosthetics and all this was in, is in the script, I think it was described. Um, and uh, there's like, you know, a couple of women, a couple of men, whatever. We said, you know, uh, this is this is crossing a line. Like this, these images don't need to be out in the world in, in people's heads, you know, and, and you're, you're, tell, you're telling a story, it's great. And, uh, and, um, and Buddy sat down and talked with us about it. And most white male producer, director, writer, people would just say, no, fuck you, get the fuck out of here. You know, we're doing this thing. I don't give a shit what you think. You know, I mean, that's, that's more the norm of our industry, historically. And Buddy says, that's interesting, you know. And, and Buddy, you know, um, I think he went to church every week. And, wonderful family his wife had a cameo in the film and mm -hmm. his, his little boy did mm -hmm. and uh you know he just it just wasn't the image of someone who would want to put all his time and money into into this this, this scene right and um and so but he says you know he says it's just make-believe it's not it's not real and it was it is and it made me a little sad i thought well no it's not real but we're trying to make it real we have the best people in, you know, in the business right here, right now, this moment, you know, trying trying to make it look exactly real. So it isn't just fantasy or a sketching it in. You know, very graphic. You know, and he said, "Well, it's just it's just make believe. It's not it's not real, so it doesn't matter." And uh, you know, I always disagree. But but you know, we left it at that disagreement. And then I think there's four or five of us who are not operating microphones or cameras who said, "You know what? We're we're not going to be on set. You know, we'll set it up, the hmm. lighting, but we won't we won't be on set. I don't want I don't want to see that." Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I know in this in this uh, summer camp, uh, maybe it's a little downer to talk about that. But oh, that's just my feeling. I think coming out of the era of the Vietnam War and American imperialism and all the violence in our in our lives, I just that's just where I came out of. But but I love action and violence. You know. Well, that's an interesting. Don't get me wrong. Well, that's a spectrum, though, right? Because like for instance, Tom Savini uh, was very heavily influenced by what he saw in Vietnam and he carried it over into his special effects work. And then I think other people have made them completely shy away from some, something like that because of the exposure yeah. to it. So there's two right. ways in right. that era. I think people could go and both work for whatever's sure. right yeah. for you, you know, exactly. But, exactly. um, well, yeah, I was in El Salvador very quickly. I was in El Salvador two years later and, uh, doing a documentary about a, a guerrilla leader in the late eighties during the civil war, you know, with Americans. Um, and so forth. And um, uh, the American helicopters would, would shell the edge of our refugee camp you know, every once in a while. And then um, one day we heard a big boom at seven in the morning. And we went running over to see what was going on. And um, these kids were playing. And uh, one kid uh, uh, stepped on a mine. And he was, there was half of him. And the bottom half was gone. Oh my God. You know, so, what, what, you know, paid, paid by my tax money, you know. And uh, it's horrific, you know, so that changes your view. And of course, 20, 30 years later, I'm in CSI New York, and we did a scene where a gang chainsaws a guy in half. And we film it, and it's in flashbacks, and you see it, and you see that we do the whole back, you know, there's a guy with a torso, and he's, he's dead, and, and it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, there's a world, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, it is interesting. And so we're kind of at the end, but one of the questions I really wanted to ask was, um, having started kind of outside of the system and then moving into the system the way you guys have in such big ways, uh, could you just both briefly kind of tell me what you've noticed the major differences are between working on these little, uh, you know, regional type films into the big Hollywood system? Ellen, did you want to answer that? Sure. Um, it's, wait a second. There's, so many more people there's so many more people on um especially on a contemporary larger studio film um than on a small independent job and and you it, it it's it's too completely in in that aspect 
it's it's really very very different um you really have to adjust to the fact that you're going to have a bigger crew i mean i would work on a crew on my own sometimes with like two maybe three people with me and then suddenly you move into the studio films that are larger and it affords larger crew and sometimes you're on really giant jobs and they have you've got like 20 people and um working under you and you know that you have to direct um and also you have so much, you have so many more producers. Uh oh, my dog. You have so many more <laughs> producers. Um, uh, you have so many more producers on the job, so many more um, voices that you have to please. I mean, back in the day, you'd be walking around with um, you'd be walking around with a folder with polaroids fitting polaroids and under your arm and you get the director and you pull him all pull him or her over and you look at the polaroids and pick stuff and now like you upload photos you hmm. to to um dropbox or smug mug or one of these things and the world can see them <laughs> you know what i mean i mean you don't even know who the heck is looking at them. Mm -hmm. You don't even know where the final say is sometimes. I mean, you could be working on a television show and you've got the entire, um, you've got the entire uh, writer's room chiming in. And it's kind of, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird because it, it, it sort of takes the spontaneity out of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, it, it sometimes it adds a lot more work, a lot more work. I mean, just the, just the, just dealing with that many people. It's, it's like with wardrobe, you, it, costumes, you deal with people all the time anyway. It's not like, you know, you got into this and you hate people and you don't want to deal with them. You deal with them. But um, it, it really layers so much more. Um, and also the fact that you're dealing with um, people with star power, that has to be acknowledged, you know, that has to be acknowledged. And that sometimes is, is hard. It's really hard. And that's like one of the things that I find sort of between um, the, uh, between like independent, low budget and the studio system, which include, cause you know, they've got systems, they've got the legal systems. They've got accounting systems, and that's something that we all do. I mean, costume designers write budgets and schedules, and you know, um, go shopping, manage returns, uh, manage you know tailor shops, uh, you know, on. A, I mean, like scenic art, manage scenic artists that paint the stuff. You know, what whatever you have to do, um, and. Uh, it's really it's it's really an interesting thing to come up against uh, decision by committee. It's very hard. It's it's very frustrating. Um, it's something it, it, it's something that uh, all costume designers like know. And, and mm. I mean, the younger ones obviously don't. But anyone that's been around for a while before the the Internet and all these programs, all these sharing programs, knows that um it really it really changed it it really changed it and sometimes it's really easy to lose control of the stuff mm -hmm. because it's approved <laughs> you, know what I mean? you can't like go i you know it's approved <laughs> um does john have time to answer the question or are we gonna wrap it up um if we can make it quick okay John, do you have any final thoughts on really that? Really quick, I, I agree with everything she said, and, uh, and I think that my one example would be uh, working with Marvel, which is huge. Um, I did a project recently, and, and they, in the color timing room, which is, you know, the smaller the project, the more control a direct photography has, and that's so crucial. If you, can't, if you don't have control of color timing, you didn't get what you really wanted. And um, I went from having just the timer, and maybe someone else coming by, to having, I think, 14 people, mm. Disney, uh, ABC, Marvel, uh, Dolby, because it was Dolby HDR, and everyone started inputting into the timer. And I just, I, you know, I, okay, 
you know, so it's that kind of thing. And so you get things by being bigger and then you, you lose things. And I think that often the smaller projects where it's more direct creative control is, is, is more satisfying for me. And I would think, you know, for Ellen as well. No, it's totally true. true. But Ellen, Ellen described it very like, well. When you ask me about the collaboration on uh, Friday the 13th part two, uh, total I mean, total collaboration. First of all, it wasn't a lot of money not a lot of people and you're dealing directly. I worked with Susan Kaufman who has, you know, an incredible eye, an incredible sense of irony and um, a sense of humor and everything. And I trusted, you know, to be able to follow her tone, the tone that she set so that, you know, cause it's really important that you, you reach the same tone um, of over the top, how much over the top, how much real, whatever, you know, and that is something, I mean, you do it anyway on the bigger jobs, but when, when you're really small, the intimacy and, mm -hmm. you know, you really put your heads together and also you, you're not being interfered with unnecessarily because the guys that were in the room, the guys, the ladies, whoever they were in the room with John knew nothing about color timing. Am I right? For the most part, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no names. <laughs> but yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. It's, like oh, it's, it's, it's frustrating, yeah. I think that's a great way to wrap this up, though. It's, it's great to hear that the smaller films, um, they've got this endearing quality and that you guys do really work hard and there's a different level of artistry that goes into them. And I'm so happy that you could both be here to talk about them. And again, this is Ellen Letter and John Newby. And just thank you both so much for taking the time out to indulge me with uh, my love of horror movies and talking about this stuff. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank Thanks you, for the interview. Thank you. That was a blast. That was fun. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Amanda, for fantastic chairing.